Hello, welcome to another video from the conscientious biologist, Ben Gallagher. This one follows directly on from cells two, which was on differentiation. And it now looks at how those differentiated cells have become specialized, what those specializations are. And we'll look at some of the key examples in both animals and plants. This is suitable for GCSE level. And if you haven't done so already, please do subscribe to my channel. Thank you. We're going to look at three distinct examples of animal cells now and how they're specialized. So let's start off with nerve cells. Now, the correct name for a nerve cell is a neuron. OK, a nerve is a whole load of neurons together. OK, so a nerve cell is just a neuron. So let's think about that. Let's first look at the purpose of a nerve cell. It needs to carry electrical impulses around the body. These are like the wires. Um, just like in an electrical device, the wires that carries the signals all around your body. So they need to be able to travel quite a long distance. So, for example, if I trod on something and it felt hot, that information needs to go up to my brain. So there must be a neuron that travels from my foot all the way up my body to my brain. That's a long distance. So the first key, key thing neurons have to be is long to quickly carry messages all around the body. So if I put our basic animal cell back on there, I'll just get rid of some of the stuff on the inside because we don't need that. How could I make that cell long? Well, if I could give you that physically, if I wanted it long, you'd hopefully grab it and just pull it and stretch it out like that. So if we just imagine I've stretched it out and that's that same cell, but now stretched out. I've had to massively scale it down. So if I put the nucleus back in there in the middle, you can see it's a bit faint, but you can see I've put the nucleus in. I've scaled it down to try and show you how long these cells can be. That means it can carry a signal a long way, but look at what would happen. That nucleus is now sort of squashed in the middle and that arrow I've just shown zooming across it, that would have to be an electrical signal. Well, think about what that electrical signal could do to the nucleus. The nucleus contains the DNA. If that DNA got damaged by that electrical signal, the DNA wouldn't be able to be read, you wouldn't be able to make the proteins, the cell wouldn't be able to function. So we can't have the nucleus sat there right in the way. But that's OK, because nerve cells, neurons have weird bits. OK, if you look at what I've just added on the far end there, they've got this big, pulled out, tweaked, spiky end. All of those bits, all of the black line there, that's all still membrane. It's as if you imagine you had it made out of plasticine. You've just kind of grabbed and pulled and tweaked some of the plasticine out to make all those kind of spoky bits. Now, because you've got those, we can pop the nucleus there in the middle of that. Now, there's plenty of room around it for the electrical signal can zoom around it. The nucleus isn't going to get damaged. But what you've also done, you've created loads of little spikes. Each one of those can receive information from different areas and then send it down the neuron. So actually having that big place to house the nucleus, much better for the nucleus, but also allows the neuron to contact lots of different places and pick up signals from lots of different places. But of course, if you're going to be branched on one end, it would only be sensible to be branched at the other end as well. Now, having those branches on the other end means when the signal comes along, you can then spread that signal back out and deliver a message to lots of places. You're not just taking a signal to one bit of the body, you can branch it out and send it to various places as well. So being highly branched at both ends is really, really useful because that means at the far end, you can collect information from multiple sources. But at the nearer end, you can pass it on to a wider area. OK, now, next thing we're going to add to this, I've put all these little blobs all the way along it there. Those are for insulation, because think about an electrical wire. We've already compared it to electrical wires in, in a some kind of device. The electricity could escape if it didn't have insulation around it. You think about wiring, it always has that kind of plastic insulation. Well, those blobs on there are the insulation that wraps it around. They're actually made of cells. Each one of those blobs is a cell that's wrapped itself round and round and round the long bit of the neuron. But you don't need to worry about that. That comes in more when you do A level. But those cells wrapped around it provide a layer of insulation which stops the electrical impulse, the signal, from escaping. That keeps it moving quickly along the neuron to get to its destination. So let's throw some labels on here quickly. Obviously, we've got to have um, membrane and cytoplasm to make it a cell. Please don't forget, just because this is a weird shape, it's still got those fundamental parts. It's got the membrane, it's got the cytoplasm, it's got the nucleus. There would be ribosomes in there as well, but I don't want to draw them on there and confuse the diagram. Um, that whole big spiky bit on the end that houses the nucleus, that's called the cell body. 
The branches that lead into the cell body are called dendrites. The long, thin bit of the cell, the kind of first thing that we pulled up on the screen, that's called the axon. The insulated bit, the blobs, that's called the myelin sheath, but it's the insulation. And at the end, you've got the axon branches. That's quite logical because the thin bit was the axon. And when it gets to its end, the axon branches. So that's a very logical name. I suggest you take a screenshot there because that covers all of the information on a neuron. But it's really, really important you can identify all those different parts, name them and explain the reasons for them. OK, let's look at our second cell. So these are muscle cells. We can go quite quickly on this one because there's not a huge amount that's overly complicated there. Muscle cells look like this, though. They're like we've taken that original animal cell and we just kind of pinched the ends in a little bit. You've still got the nucleus in there. There would still be ribosomes in there. It still needs to make its DNA. I just don't want to clutter the diagram too much by putting too much in there. But if I've got one muscle cell there, the key feature of muscle cells are these. These are protein fibres that run from one end of the cell to the other end of the cell. And there's lots of them, but they're made of protein. Remember, proteins do everything. And what these protein fibres can do is they can pull in to contract the cell. So each one of those proteins, they kind of overlap a bit like this, like I'm showing with my fingers. And the proteins within those fibres can pull on each other to overlap more, to shrink it in. Now, if all of that happens all the way along the muscle fibre, the whole fibre pulls in, it pulls the cell in shorter. Of course, it thickens because it's getting shorter and we get this. Of course, that can relax and go back to how it was. That's the only things muscles can do, really. They can contract and they can relax. Now, if I put that in with loads of other muscles, if I create some muscle tissue, hopefully you can suddenly see why it's that shape. By having that pinched off end, they can beautifully tessellate together and fit really, really nicely. And every one of those cells on there would be full of the muscle fibres and those muscle fibres could all contract. So it would pull the whole lot in. Now, you imagine if I'd have made that diagram of a thousand muscle cells going all the way along, then it would shrink in enormously. And because it can shrink in, the whole, all of those muscle cells, remember a huge collection of cells of the same type is known as a tissue, that can provide a very large pulling effect. If they're all contracting, they're pulling in on both ends. Now, the reason for that is that the pulling of those muscles pulls your skeleton around, allowing you to move. This really, we're talking only about skeletal muscle. There are two other forms of muscle in your body, but we're not gonna worry about those. But skeletal muscle pulls in, contracts, pulls on the skeleton to pull all of your body around to move all the different bits okay so that's what muscle cells need to do but of course those contractions that pulling requires a huge amount of energy so apply your knowledge from the last lesson what do you think we'd find loads of in muscle cells what are going to do a reaction to provide that energy hopefully you've worked out that it's mitochondria muscle cells are absolutely packed with mitochondria because mitochondria do respiration to get the energy out of glucose. OK, so that's a muscle cell. That's our second key cell. Okay, it's third one, a sperm cell. A sperm cell is one of the two types of gamete and a gamete is a sex cell. So we're talking about sperm cells and egg cells. Now, sperm cells seem to come up a lot in exams because they're highly specialized. There's a lot of key features that they have. So if we think about a sperm cell and what it needs to do, a sperm cell carries 50% of the man's DNA and it has to carry it to the egg so that it can fertilize the egg, 50% from the sperm and the 50% from the egg, can fuse together to make 100%, that fertilized egg can then grow into a baby. So they're really, really essential cells for the continuation of our species. So let's have a look at it. Over here, let's put the standard kind of cell stuff. We've got the membrane, we've got the cytoplasm, we've got the nucleus. Again, there would be ribosomes in there. I'm just not drawing it onto this because I don't want to clutter the diagram. So we've got the basic cellular bits there. The nucleus, though, specialist bit of sperm cells, it contains only 50% of the father's DNA, the other 50 from the egg from the mother. We've already mentioned that. But sperm cells have this middle section here. We'll come back to why in a second, because they also have this long tail section. Now, hopefully you know this already. The tail section, it's pretty obvious, can move. It can flap around to propel the sperm towards the egg. 
So that's the bit that's going to allow it to swim. But think that movement, that, that flipping around, requires a huge amount of energy. So again, what do you think there are loads of in a sperm cell? It's the same as the muscle cell. There's loads of mitochondria. And this is why we have that middle section. It's because it's full of loads and loads of mitochondria, all doing loads and loads of respiration to provide loads and loads of energy to allow the swimming to happen. Um, so just to keep it, keep it on that, make sure when you're answering in the exams, try and break it into different steps to maximize your chance of getting the marks. So the middle section, full of lots of mitochondria, which provide the energy needed for swimming through respiration. Really important key points. One last bit of a sperm cell is an acrosome. This is the bit just here. It's right in the very nose of the sperm. Now you think about what the nose bit has to do. When it gets to the egg, it needs to burrow its way into the egg so it can fertilize it. So the acrosome is actually full of lots of digestive enzymes that help it eat its way into the egg. They kind of dissolve through the outer layer of the egg so the sperm can break into the egg, release its nucleus into the egg, which is what fertilization is. Okay, So the key parts from this, I'll just highlight them because that was a, a lot of information there. These are the four things you'll be expected to mention in the exam, that the nucleus only contains 50%, that the acrosome has got the digestive enzymes to break into it, you don't need to worry about specifically saying it's a middle section, but you do need to know sperm contain lots and lots of mitochondria to give the energy by doing respiration, and that the tail is for swimming. That's the bit that moves around. Again, that probably needs a screenshot so you can add that to your notes, but that's the third cell. It's pretty straightforward stuff. Now, there are loads of other specialist animal cells. Even if we're just restricting ourselves to human, we've got so many different types of cell in our body. Just to mention a few, but we're not going to look at them in detail now because they come up when they become relevant in the course. But let's just add a few onto this. So hopefully these you recognise, red blood cells, full of haemoglobin. That's a protein again, the protein haemoglobin, which can carry oxygen around the body. We'll look at those when we do um, circulatory system and a bit when we do respiratory system. White blood cells. White blood cells play such a vital role in fighting off disease in your body. And there's two main types, the phagocytes and the lymphocytes. We'll do those when we come to immunology. But they're a really important type of cell. These ones that look a bit weird, they've got sort of a feathery finger structures on top. These are ciliated epithelial cells. They come up twice in the course. Um, once when we're talking about um, protection against disease, because you've got these cells that line your trachea to try and catch any bad things that you might breathe in. But you also have these type of cells in your small intestine because they increase surface area for absorbing nutrients. But again, we'll cover those when it's relevant. Last one, just as an extra, just to pair it up with the sperm cell we've talked about, is an egg cell, an ovum. Again, we'll talk about that when we do reproduction and when we look at meiosis. But egg cell, key points, has the other 50% of the DNA, and they're also massive, loads and loads of nutrients in a egg cell cytoplasm, because that's the nutritional store for the early first divisions of what will eventually become a baby. So those are just some other specialist animal cells. Now, it would be wrong of me to not include some plant cells in this video, but both of the examples I'm going to give you are very, very thoroughly explained in the photosynthesis lessons on the plant physiology. So we're just going to very briefly whiz over them now so that you know these sort of go in the group of specialist cells that you need to know about, but we'll cover them in more detail in another video. But if we start off with the palisade cell, palisade cells are the really, really important cells you get in a leaf. These are the ones that collect almost all of the sunlight and trap it ready for photosynthesis. So these are the key cells that do photosynthesis. Let's just throw all the labels back on there from the last presentation. Just check them off to yourself what you've got, just as a, as a review, as a reminder. You've got the cellulose cell wall on the outside, membrane inside that, cytoplasm, ribosomes to build the proteins, nucleus containing the DNA, which is the instructions for the proteins, chloroplast to do the photosynthesis, mitochondria to do the respiration, large permanent vacuole for storage. But let's get rid of those because we're not worried about that when we talk about it just as a specialist cell. This cell's key job is to absorb light energy. So its main adaptation is its length. It's a really, really long cell by plant cell standards. Most of them might be half that length. Uh, it's also got way more chloroplasts than most cells would. Look at it, all those sort of greenish ovals that I've got in there are chloroplasts. That's because 
when light comes into the top, it doesn't have to travel very far through until lots of the energy has gone out into the chloroplast. That's why I started with a big uh, yellow arrow and it's become less as its energy has gone into the cell. As you move further through, the arrow is even smaller because that energy has been absorbed by the cell. By the time you, any light comes out of the bottom, there's very little light energy coming out the other end of the palisade cell. Almost all of it has been absorbed. So that's a palisade cell. That's described in more detail later on in the photosynthesis lessons. Your second example is a root hair cell. This is in the root of a plant and it has this very long projection, this membrane projection to increase its surface area for osmosis because roots need to absorb the water. And by having all that extra membrane, they've got way more space in which they can absorb water to take it into the plant. Again, we'll look at those in far more detail when they're relevant to your topic but i want them in your heads now and if you're keeping a list of these are all the specialist cells i need to know then these two should definitely be on that list so very quick summary of this video then first one most important thing from this is that cells become specialized by differentiation and they do this by turning off the dna for any proteins they don't need. And this is the nice way to remember that. They screw up the DNA so it can't be read. They only hold on to the bits of DNA that they need to make the proteins that they need. That allows them to focus on a specialist function and do that function really, really well. You imagine if one cell was trying to do everything, if it was trying to make hormones and trying to contract like a muscle cell and trying to swim and trying to do everything, it wouldn't be able to do anything very well if it was trying to do all of it at once, just like you wouldn't be able to do anything very well if you were trying to do 20 things at once. You need to focus on one. So really, differentiation is just about allowing the cell to focus on doing one job really, really well. There's many specialist cells to carry out the great many functions required in a multicellular organism. For animal cells, these are the key ones you need to know. So nerve cells, muscle cells, sperm cells, red blood cells, white blood cells, ciliated cells and egg cells. And for plant cells, the key two really are just palisade cells and root hair cells. There are some other ones that come up in the course. Phloem cells, xylem cells. There's a few other cells in the leaf especially guard cells on the bottom of the leaf, but we'll get to those when they're relevant to the course. These really cover almost all of the examples that you need to know, but it's how they become specialized that's really, really important. So the key thing really from this video is you need to be able to look at the features of a cell, even if it's a cell you've never seen before, and you need to decide why it has this thing behind this whole video. If you've got a cell and you're looking at it and it's got loads of mitochondria, you need to straight away be going, that must be a cell that requires a lot of energy. What must it be doing that needs that much energy? If it's got a tail like structure, like a sperm, you could be thinking, well, that cell obviously needs to move. If it's got loads and loads and loads and loads of ribosomes in it, maybe think, wow, that cell must need to, need to make loads of proteins. You've got to be able to apply your cell biology knowledge, what all the different bits do, to a function, to a specialised function in a specialised cell. That's the key skill. That's what you need to be able to do. So that was a lot of information in this video and a lot of different cells to think about. But the Cells 4 video focuses on one very special, very specific type of cell, which are called stem cells. So please head to that video now. There should be a link to it coming up. As always, if you haven't subscribed already, please do subscribe to my channel. And if you've enjoyed this video, click a little like below it. Thank you.